Hello, I'm Clovis Casali in Paris. Time for Culture on France 24 with our guest today, Ethiopian-American author Dinao Mengistu. As a journalist, he covered the wars in Darfur and in northern Uganda, but he's here to talk about his work as a novelist. With his new book, All Our Names, the story of a young man who flees war-torn Uganda in the 1960s for the American Midwest. It's been named one of the best books of the year by the New York Times and the Washington Post. Dinao Mengistu, great having you on the set. Thank you very much. I read that this novel is set to be the third and last part of your work on African diaspora. Is it correct? And how does uh, this book of yours, All Our Names, fit into this uh, trilogy? Yeah, um, you know, the very first book I tried writing was was an attempt to think about what happens to these migrants who leave their homes and come to America and don't, don't necessarily find the lives that they were looking for. And I think since then, with each new book, I've been trying to figure out how that problem looks when cast in a different light. So now with this novel, it's trying to figure out what happens to somebody who's quite young and doesn't necessarily want to come to America and comes bearing all the grief and all the scars of having lived through a pretty complicated war. And uh, were you influenced by your own personal experience with your family moving from Ethiopia to the U.S.? De you know, definitely. Um, we left Ethiopia when I was two years old and came to a very small town in the Midwest and lived a very quintessentially American childhood. And it's only as you sort of grow older, you begin to realize just how sort of complicated that narrative is and that maybe you might have lived through it, but you need to, to tell other stories to try to figure out exactly how your family came to have those experiences, what it meant for my parents to leave home, to Must leave their family. Must have been quite family. a big change. Yeah, and I think for them enormously, you know, it's um, as a child of immigrants, you you inherit the sort of loss of your parents. You don't necessarily remember it, but you know that at some point in time there was a place, there was a country, there was a culture that was taken away. Mm -hmm. And now as a novelist, you get a chance to um, to try to figure out how it would have felt to actually lose those places for yourself. So let's talk about this novel of yours, yeah. All Our Names. And uh, let's start with the two characters, the two boys in Uganda that you describe as a team. Can you tell me a bit more about that special bond between the two? Yeah, they're... Um you know, when the book began, I had the idea that there was two young men on a campus somewhere in Africa who were full of optimism, that there was this great period at the end of the colonial era where lots of young men thought that their countries were about to undergo another radical revolution of freedom and liberty and all these great opportunities were going to be made available to them. And these two boys, they arrive on this campus very poor, but full of hopes and full of just sort of the dreams of any young person. And over the course of the novel, you begin to understand that those dreams aren't necessarily going to be fulfilled. But they do have this incredible intimacy, this sort of bond, this friendship that develops in place of those shattered dreams. And another special bond is between Helen, a social worker from the Midwest, and one of those two boys. Uh, Helen, who falls in love with one of these yeah. boys, she, does, she knows very little about him. And that's maybe part of what attracts her to him. Yeah, because, you know, there's... um. There's always, for me, two sides of the narrative of migration. There are the people who leave their homes. And Helen became a chance to think about the person who's actually already at home and has somebody new suddenly arriving in her life. And there's a, you know, the way we treat our migrants is oftentimes a reflection of where we are in our own particular lives. So we can choose to reject these people and say, you don't belong here. Or in Helen's case, she can find something mysterious and compelling and interesting. And rather than choosing to throw this person out, she falls in love. And uh, this book is structured in a rather interesting way. You were talking about two narratives. You've got two points of views. Can you explain to our viewers uh, what you intended to do? You know, when, the, you know, when the novel began, I thought it would take place entirely in Africa with these young men on a college campus, and then Helen's voice emerged. And I realized mm. this novel was as much about Africa as it was about America, as it was about the rest of the world. And to some degree, the novel needed to reflect that in its structure. So after a period in Africa, I needed Helen's voice to come in and tell me a different story. And her story would then lead me to figure out what had happened to these boys in Africa. And so those two narratives became deeply intertwined. It's part of a conversation that goes on in the story. And uh, this novel offers, of course, also an insight into decolonization, Uganda's war for independence. And, and you show truly that beyond the whole beliefs, ideals, what these men were fighting for, uh, there's also widespread violence. And clearly, there's no good, there's no yeah. bad. Yeah, definitely. And because, you know, the violence is oftentimes thought of as, as just sort of existing almost for its own sake. And violence oftentimes is its own form of political expression. Mm -hmm. So what happens after the end of the colonial era when you have these great political movements start turning more and more autocratic and more and more tyrannical? And you take away people's rights to, con to be able to express themselves democratically and oftentimes violence becomes another form of that expression.
And it's hard to find a hero in your book. Well, because I, I, I think heroes are a little bit too easy sometimes. Mm. You know, I'm more interested in the characters who, um, who strive to do great things and oftentimes fail. I think that tends to be the way we, we generally live our lives. We hope to do our best, and sometimes we get to do it, but most of the time we fall a little bit short of what we hope for. Um, so you portray the, the whole build-up to the revolution in Uganda uh, with universities uh, playing an important role. Do you feel that in Africa and in the Western world in general, uh, young people are now a lot less politicized, that uh, people nowadays, young people, don't really have a cause to fight for, as opposed to a, the times that you yeah. describe in your book? You know, I don't. Um, the book really began because I met a group of young boys in Darfur who, who were soldiers and they were, you know, 16, 17 years mm -hmm. old. And they told me that they were all revolutionaries, that they were fighting for the cause. And after a couple of days with them, I realized what they all really wanted to be more than anything was a student. They would have dropped their weapons. They would have dropped the war if they could have just had the opportunity to go and be on a college campus. So for me, it's not so much that these, um, that the students are less politicized, but that we need to think about how our politics can actually resolve are the sort of crisis of violence that happens in a lot of our countries. And our students aren't there to necessarily take political stances, but hopefully to learn how to be better citizens of a democracy. And uh, part of the novel is also set in the US with uh, this relationship we mentioned earlier between Helen and uh, one of the two uh, men, boys, uh, yeah. who met in Uganda. Um, you show that there was a great deal of prejudice, of racism in the 1960s in the Midwest. Um, what kind of research did you do to uh, to write that part? Is it, again, yeah. personal experience? Is yeah. it more... You know, fortunately, the research is pretty easy. You just have to, mm. you just have to look back on your own life and, and, and recall some of your own memories. And a lot of times, I think people want to think that America, America has made great progress, but that um, if we don't have necessarily the same overt forms of discrimination, that suddenly everything is okay. And I think what I'm, what I'm interested in, what happens in the novel, is the subtle forms of discrimination that continue to haunt us. We may not put signs on our windows saying no blacks allowed, but we have other ways of making people feel unwelcome and uninvited. And when you think about it, racial segregation in the US was only 50 years ago or so. And we saw that tensions can still arise between communities. We saw it with the recent events in, uh, in Ferguson. How did you view uh, these events? Were you surprised by such an outburst yeah. of violence or not? Um, you know, I don't think anyone's that surprised. Anyone who's ever spent time in poor communities across America, you can't be that surprised because you're not only frustrated by what happens with the police presence in a lot of these communities, but also the way in which these sort of endemic systems of poverty have kind of maintained themselves after all these, you know, after all these decades. We had the civil rights movement, we had fights for equality, but there's still an enormous amount of work to be done in America, especially in our cities where in communities have remained impoverished now for generations. And that frustration eventually is going to find its expression. Um, and you've also worked as a journalist, and that's why I was asking yeah. you about Ferguson, because obviously you looked at those events with a very specific eye, as you are yeah. a journalist. You worked on Darfur, Gander. I imagine that those experiences have fed your writing. Oh, without a doubt. And, um, you know, this novel owes a lot to the experiences I've had working in um, as a journalist in Africa and also thinking about what happens, of course, in our countries today. So if the novel takes place partly in America and partly in Africa, it's because you want to argue that these places are very much in conversation. So we think of the civil rights movement as having happened in the U.S., but the movement for independence in Africa was the exact same thing. It was a movement for independence, for liberation. And the frustrations that followed both of those movements bear the same marks to me. And obviously when you enter Darfur, you witnessed devastating uh, scenes, human yeah. tragedy. And another human tragedy that made the headlines recently uh, was in Nepal with this devastating earthquake. Well, now there's a film that's been released called The Nepal Quake Project, narrated by actress uh, Susan Sarandon. Uh, it's kind of a pioneer project using virtual reality uh, technology that helps immerse the viewer in the aftermath of the quake. Uh, the aim is to raise funds for those in need in Nepal. Take a look. On April 25th, 2015, a severe 7.8 magnitude earthquake struck Nepal. In just seconds, thousands of lives were lost and centuries of Nepalese culture erased. Virtual reality is this 
incredible technology with a lot of potential to bring people there and immerse them in a totally different experience. And when you're standing on the streets of Kathmandu and you see the scale of devastation, I think it really gives people compassion and empathy to get involved, to understand the magnitude of it, uh, and hopefully make some donations that can really help people. This is the town of Bhaktapur. For tens of thousands of Nepalese, their homes ended up like this. In Kathmandu, families are living in tents and rely on food distribution from aid agencies. The long lines are all people who lost their homes and their belongings. Very, very powerful footage indeed. Um, do you know, Mengistu, what do you think of uh, this virtual reality technology? Uh, do you think it's desirable uh, in the world of yeah. news when covering stories such as Nepal? Well, I think I think it's always important to be a little skeptical sometimes about what the end goal and what how the, those things are going to impact the viewer. If the idea is that you can simply witness these things and suddenly now you have an understanding or that you're really immersed, I'm not sure I'm convinced of that. And we've seen what happened in Haiti after the earthquake mm. and the devastation. Millions of dollars were given, millions more were wasted. So just simply planting people inside of those places, I'm not sure that's um, the ultimate goal or the ultimate way to actually sort of improving those lives. I think we need more information, definitely, but I think we also need content context in our information, not just to suddenly drop ourselves into a place and pretend like we know what's happened as a result of that. Do you know, Mengis, it was really nice talking to you. Thank you. Your latest novel called All Our Names will be out ev end of August in France and it's published by Albin Michel. That's it for today. Don't forget to check out our website www.france24.com and find us on social networks. I leave you with a clip from the exhibition Photomed currently on in the south of France until end of June and it focuses on Mediterranean photography. See you soon.